Cheney came to power. They solidified their positions by goading the United States and prompting it to issue threats it could not carry out. If the American hostages are harmed, a severe price will be paid. But it wasn't, of course. The only price was paid by the hostages and their families and the American politicians who seemed so impotent in the face of foreign terror. I don't understand why 52 Americans have been held hostage for almost a year now. Nearly five years after Ronald Reagan asked that question, his own policymakers were still searching for ways to extricate hostages and prevent further kidnappings. They got this advice. I'm saying no concessions, no negotiations, and retaliation when this is over. This was the hijacking of TWA 847 and the days and nights of terror. Hostage passengers were flown back and forth across the Middle East in an orgy of terrorist demands and proclamations. Again, Americans heard their president talk tough. Let me further make it plain to the assassins in Beirut and their accomplices, wherever they may be, that America will never make concessions to terrorists. To do so would only invite more terrorism. But nothing seemed to stop terrorism. Ronald Reagan flexed America's muscles. He sent Marines and saw them die. He sent jet fighters and saw some shot down. He sent a battleship that fired and hit civilians. And he even sold arms to the country that was supporting the terrorists. Nothing worked. Today, with a new president, the United States faces the same old problem. Once again, an American president faces the agony of families pleading for the lives of their loved ones. Please, don't execute him, please. That's what I want to tell him, that's all. The Lebanese wife of Joseph Sicipio pleading to his captors. They said they were extending his death sentence by 48 hours. If you can help me, please go ahead, okay? I'm, I'm just asking the whole world, if there will be any one of you that he can help, please do it. Today, with this new crisis, there's a new Congress, but some of its members are still calling for the old solution, action. This is a, a very difficult situation, and I think President Reagan set the standard when he bombed Libya. Libya. It stopped Gaddafi's fooling around in terrorism for at least four years. Maybe the same must be applied to Iran. Even so, the relatives of one man who has tried hardest at the greatest personal sacrifice continued today to counsel patience and nonviolence. Surely it's not beyond the wit of the West, the cleverest minds in the West, in the United States, to find a way of talking out a solution rather than fighting out one. And just a few minutes ago, the Israeli foreign minister was talking about, you know, we either fight these people or surrender. I don't see it in those black and white terms. It's not, life isn't just fighting or surrendering. It's trying to get on with people, understanding people. I know there may be difficulties, but surely it's not beyond any of our wit to, to, to keep on talking. Ultimately, the United States found itself following that path today, working behind the scenes to bargain with terrorists doing in private what it has promised in public never to do, negotiate. ABC correspondents in Rome, Washington, and Tel Aviv picked up signs of it. Israel's offer to exchange prisoners for Western hostages in Lebanon is still on the table. Indirect negotiations are said to be underway. Nothing is ruled in or out at this point, but the effort today, at least, was diplomacy. One factor in the hostage equation has changed from a decade ago. The man in whose name it began is dead. And correspondent Julie Flint says that his followers, especially those in Lebanon, are nervous. They are not quite sure what exactly the new government in Iran has in store for them. They are not sure that Iran, under the new post-Khomeini leadership, will continue to support them as it has before. They have been told by the leaders of Iran, that Tehran will continue to try to export its revolution, but by new non-violent means. They don't know what exactly that means for the moment. Nor does the West know exactly where this latest crisis is leading. So far, the White House hasn't issued the sort of warning that many presidents have found necessary. But despite the restraint here, the situation tonight is the same in many ways as it's been for all these years. Americans are being held hostage and their countrymen, if even only for a brief moment, feel they've been taken captive too. This is John Martin for Nightline in Washington.
When we come back, how does a president face up to tough decisions in the midst of intense public pressure? We'll be joined by Israeli Deputy Foreign Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, by Jody Powell, who was White House Press Secretary under President Carter, and by former President Reagan's Communications Director, Patrick Buchanan. This is ABC News Nightline. Brought to you by new Raid Max insecticides. We put a thousand cockroaches in this model house and this incredible new roach bait. Only new Raid Max attacks with self-fluoramine. So powerful for every roach that takes the bait, up to 50 more can die in their nest. In three days, we remove the dead roaches and search for survivors. All we saw was Raid Max. New Raid Max Roach Bait. When Max attacks, you win. Four profiles in quality. Pride. When you get pride, you get quality. That's what I said back in 81. And today we still have that same pride. And from what we hear, a lot of people think we're doing a pretty good job. You can hear the quality. You can see the quality. You can feel the quality in the way it handles. Thanks. That's what happens at Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln when quality is job one. I made a great decision. I was ready to go to college, but I worried about a big school with huge classes where my instructors wouldn't even know who I was. So I called on my local community college. They gave me the kind of teachers who cared about my future and who worked with me when I needed help. My community college is really making things happen for me. So make a great decision. Call your local community college today. Mr. Bobby McFerrin. Ah, yeah. for ocean spray. So tangy. So crisp. Taste refreshing ocean spray cran raspberry. It's music to your mouth. Ah. Oh. Grapefruit juice? No, Ocean Spray Pink Grapefruit Juice Cocktail. It's not what you think. It's not bitter. Ah, uh, sweeter. It's all yours. <laughs> Ocean Spray Pink. If there were no TV, he'd go door to door. Imagine what'll happen when he has his own show. Sam Donaldson, Diane Sawyer. Primetime Live premieres this Thursday. Benjamin Netanyahu, who's with us now live from Tel Aviv, is Israel's deputy foreign minister and head of the Israeli task force that is dealing with the present crisis. Jody Powell, who joins us in our New York studios, was President Jimmy Carter's press secretary and is currently president of a Washington-based public relations concern, Ogilvy & Mather Public Affairs. Pat Buchanan, who's in our Washington bureau, served in two presidential administrations. He was President Reagan's Director of Communications from 85 through 87 and was also a speechwriter for President Nixon. He is currently host of the CNN program, Crossfire. Pat, let me begin with you. Right. Any recollections, particularly uh, during the Reagan administration, of how the public pressure impacted on the policy that the president felt obliged to follow? Well, certainly one day, Ted, uh, it was the day of the Achille Lauro intercept. I got on the uh, helicopter with President Reagan. We were flying to Chicago out there for a rally about tax reform. And the president was enraged by an editorial he saw in the Washington Times, which suggested he had been a wimp after this act of terrorism had occurred. Now, they were planning all along that day, and I was unaware of it at the time, the intercept of the, uh, the intercept of the plane coming out of Egypt. Now, I don't know if the president made the decision there, but clearly he was influenced by the, the names he was being called, the public pressure on him to do something and to act. And I think in that case, it was a healthy influence. I don't know if it was determinate, but it certainly influenced uh, uh, the president's, I think, state of mind when he decided to go ahead and intercept that plane over the skies of the Mediterranean. Now, what about the influence that the families of the hostages had on him? And, of course, he met with some of those families. And how healthy do you think that influence was? The two examples. I think the influence on the president, who was a deeply compassionate man, was not good. He really felt it deeply in his heart when we would take them in there. He wanted to do something badly and I think offered an option. He went ahead and did it. Let me contrast that with Richard Nixon. We were told in 1969 through 72 that if there was bombing of North Vietnam, that these prisoners, American POWs, would be put on trial and executed. 
Richard Nixon instead, when he felt he had to do something, treated those POWs as though they were lost, and he ordered the B-52 bombing of Haiphong and Hanoi. And that bombing was the one thing that got those prisoners back. So I think in this case, Ted, we are in a war as well, and you have to treat your own people who are over there as POWs in a war. And sometimes the best way to get them back is really, and it may be callous to say it, but treat them as though they are lost. Jody Powell, is that something, in fact, that any American politician can ever do, given the kind of uproar that it would create, both in the media and in public opinion? I'll, I'll answer the question in a minute. Let me be a little bit impolite, though, and take issue with what I'm sure was an unintentional, but nevertheless, I think, uh, misleading bit of journalism earlier. You showed President Carter saying, uh, very clearly that if the Iranians killed our hostages, they would pay a high price for it. Then you showed a picture of a funeral and the handing of a flag to grieving relatives. The fact of the matter is that that warning worked. Uh, those hostages did come home safely. There were no funerals for those, for those hostages. What that means beyond that point, uh, I don't know. But the, the implication that piece was was, was indeed, I think, quite misleading. No, 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 you're quite, in fact, I, I noticed the same shot, and uh, I apologize to you, to President Carter, and to our audience for that. Um, however, having said that, uh, I'm not sure that what happened to America's image in the world during that period can be said to have been quite as casualty-free. There was the perception, to use that title of the, of the origin of this program that I know was so despised at the White House at the time, that America was held hostage. No, no, it was despised and it was also inaccurate, but it, it's, it's show business. I mean, go to, go to your point, though, which I think is quite valid. You know, there is, there is absolutely no doubt that all of this does put pressure on a president. Mm -hmm. And as Pat said, you know, meeting with the family, seeing their grief, seeing their anguish, and any normal human being, and most presidents are that, uh, is painful. Nevertheless, my view of it is that, one, that comes with the turf. Presidents are paid to make difficult decisions. And two, it also comes with a democracy. You can't deny uh, a, a scared, grieving, uh, frightened mother or brother or, or, or a daughter uh, the right to make a public appeal uh, for the safety of, 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 of husband or father or, 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 or brother. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's just part of it. And I think what's, 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 what we have to deal with here is to what extent has that actually influenced American policy mm -hmm. and speaking only for myself and, and what I know about the Carter administration, it did not influence American policy. Uh, the, the president fortunately did not have to make a choice well, between the lies of Americans and America's national interest. But, he but, said all along that he believed that those two, those two points were not inconsistent and we can deal with the discussion over whether they were or not, or not later if, if you wish. But that was a fact of the matter. However, if he had had to, if he had to make that choice, I have no doubt that as painful as it would have been, he would have made the choice to serve the greater and longer term good, that is the American national interest, even at, at the risk of placing American innocent lives in jeopardy. Jody, right. let, me, let me interrupt you. Pat, let me put sure. you on hold. Ben Netanyahu, let me apologize for not having come to you in the first segment. I'm going to come to you right after this. We'll continue our discussion in a moment. To the average car, this could be a dangerous body of water, even though it's only an inch deep. That's why you should drive the new four-wheel drive Subaru Legacy, the latest in foul weather gear. This compact machine is blindingly, dizzyingly fast. Look, if we reduce the drag, what, 0 0.3? 0 0.3 is good. Compact. It's the muscle car of computers. Now, let's make it a convertible. One convertible coming up. Compaq has emerged as a leader as well as an innovator. What's the rest of Detroit going to think? They better think fast. If you don't like the looks of your car, shoot it with Son of a Gun from STP. Shoot the dash, seats, tires, and roof. Son of a Gun protected. Man. What a difference! Recently, Road and Track magazine concluded a search for the world's five best cars. After exhaustive testing and analysis, 
They chose four exotic sports cars. And even more significantly, only one sedan. The Mercedes-Benz 300E. If you haven't watched Good Morning Houston lately, you've missed many fine moments in local television. Houston's Maxine Messenger celebrates 30 years as a society columnist. <laughs> I think I know about six people who honestly do not want their name in the post. Well, I can't do that because that was... <laughs> so then, then that's it. <laughs> Two missing children were recovered safely thanks to Houston police and an eyewitness news photographer and intern. TV's favorite zookeeper, Jack Hanna, shared hospital success stories of patients who came in contact with animals and was reunited with a Houston girl who overcame her disease. Actor-director Spike Lee with an insight to his controversial film, Do the Right Thing, the big business of dog racing in Texas. Continuing advancements in constructive surgery have made it possible for a construction worker to regain use of his hand after it was completely severed with a power saw. Tis the season, the best advice for mosquito protection, and how youngsters today view the farming industry of tomorrow. Good morning, Houston. Weekdays at 9 here on 13. She stalked the deadly AIDS virus in deepest Africa. Imagine what'll happen when she has her own show. Diane Sawyer, Sam Donaldson. Primetime Live premieres Thursday. The plight of American hostages. Tomorrow updates on the situation in the Middle East. And more of our parenting series, Disciplining Your Child, on Good Morning America, tomorrow. I'd like to pick up our discussion now with Israel's Deputy Foreign Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is joining us live from Tel Aviv. Um, before we get into a couple of these larger issues that I've been discussing with Pat Buchanan and Jordi Powell, the, the kidnapping by Israeli commandos of uh, Sheikh Obeid, uh, was it worthwhile? Well, you know, we've been trying to get our uh, POWs, uh, whom we've sent to Lebanon, we wanted to get them back home uh, for quite some time. We haven't been successful. Uh, there are American and other hostages in Lebanon. We've been trying, the whole world has been trying to get them back home, unsuccessful. We found that the only way that we can do anything here is to put leverage on the leadership of the Hezbollah. That's the organization that so far has turned this patch of earth into lawless heaven. They can do anything and get away with it. Well, we've apprehended a leader. We're sending a message to them that they are not immune, uh, that we can exercise leverage on them. And it's, uh, of course, too early to tell what the results are. But we can say that without such leverage, without such pressure, I don't think there's a chance of getting these people home. And if they go ahead, and, and you of all the Israeli diplomats I know probably know the United States and the, the impact of U.S. public opinion and the media as well as anyone. If indeed they go ahead and they kill other American hostages, how long do you think it's going to be that American public opinion will put up with the notion that this was a useful thing to do? I don't think that the, first of all, we don't have confirmation that they actually uh, curled, kill, killed Colonel Higgins or that, that indeed he was, if he was murdered, he was murdered uh, yesterday or uh, a day before. Although I must and tell it, you, although I must tell you that, that U.S. intelligence is coming to the conclusion that indeed he was murdered yesterday, but you're right, no one knows for sure. Go ahead. There, there are con indications to the contrary also, but the important thing is this. I think that the American people, the Israeli people, in fact, people of common sense everywhere, know where the responsibility for these terrorists or for these actions lie. And the responsibility lies solely on the Hezbollah and the government patrons that support them, especially Iran, but also Syria, from whose territory or territory that Syria controls they operate. Now, the question that we have to address is, where do we put the pressure? The pressure can be put directly on the Hezbollah, among other things, and the way that, we, uh, that I just mentioned. It should be and can be put on the governments that support them. And I'm sure that such pressure is being applied now. And I think people can distinguish where the real responsibility, where the real source of the problem exists. These people have killed eight hostages in captivity, and they'll kill and take many more hostages unless we place the pressure and the responsibility on them and solely on them. Explain something to me. Part of the problem here is a linguistic one. When Israel takes hostages, they call them prisoners of war or prisoners. When hostages are taken from Israel, or when prisoners are taken from Israel, and Americans are referred to as hostages, is there indeed a qualitative difference between Israel holding uh, people that it has kidnapped from Lebanon and the Lebanese holding people that it has captured in their own country? There's a world of difference. 
the, the world of difference between uh, terrorists seizing somebody, passengers on a plane, innocent people, uh, or uh, people in a downtown street in Beirut, uh, American teachers, or uh, no? I'm talking about. I'm I'm talking about. Forgive me for interrupting. I'm talking about Israeli soldiers who, who after all, were apprehended not in Israel. They were apprehended in Lebanon. Sure. Uh, there, is, uh, there are soldiers who are in captivity. There are POWs. When soldiers fall into captivity uh, on uh, enemy turf, they are prisoners of war. When people are apprehended in a downtown street without an act of belligerency, uh, just uh, seized or yanked off a plane, they are hostages. They're not soldiers. They have no business uh, being hijacked. You make an uh, but excellent somebody's point. Hijacked. <clears throat> you make an excellent point, and, and it's precisely the point I was trying to make. The Israeli soldiers are prisoners of war. You apprehended, I say you, the Israeli government, uh, brought about the apprehension, the kidnapping of uh, Sheikh Obeid, not really to bring about the release of the American hostages, but principally to bring about the release of prisoners of war. Right? Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no contradiction there, because uh, if we apply pressure on the Hezbollah, uh, sure, we want to get our POWs back, but there's um, every reason to use that pressure and that leverage to get these innocent people uh, from uh, the United States, from Britain, from other countries home as well. Uh, if we already have the leverage, let's use it. Except you lose some of the moral high ground. If, you know, if we're talking about prisoners of war, fine, that's one thing. But to get prisoners of war back, and if, in other words, if you're holding prisoners of war, do you accept the right of the Lebanese to come into Israel and pick up hostages and bring them back to bring about the, the release the, of the prisoners of war? Again, there's a difference of uh, principle here that might be overlooked. There is no justification for seizing innocent people. Uh, Sheikh Obed is not an innocent person. He is, for all intents and purposes, a combatant. In fact, he's the organizer, the planner of many of these, uh, uh, these operations, these terrorist kidnappings. So we didn't just go down into uh, Lebanon and pick some uh, innocent people uh, off the street. What we've uh, targeted very surgically is the man who's actually responsible for this. This is not an innocent bystander here. Okay. Uh, this is actually the organizer of this operation. Forgive me for interrupting. We have to take a break. We'll continue our discussion with all of our guests in just a moment. Ever since Sanka decaffeinated coffee was invented, our competitors have been riding on our coattails, coming out with their own. Well, we've continued to take steps to make Sanka even better. We've moved ahead again with a natural decaffeination process that only we have, using pure water and effervescence to remove virtually none of the coffee flavor from the bean. And that means the free ride ends here. Sanka ground decaffeinated coffee. You can't beat the original. Introducing the totally redesigned 1990 four-wheel drive Toyota 4Runner. Now the additional performance from its available V6 is combined with additional comfort, additional necessities, and additional doors. Where you go in your new four-door Toyota 4Runner is your concern. Getting you back is ours. Some drinks have a dark side, a taste that may leave you thirsty, but all natural Sundance is just fruit juices and sparkling water. No added sugar, no dark side. Sundance puts refreshment in a whole new light. Only one long distance company offers so many ways to save 24 hours a day. No matter when you call, only one company, AT&T. Our Reach Out America plan lets you save 24 hours a day with all the service and quality of AT&T. No one even comes close. No one. Call 1-800-REACH-OUT now. This summer, I'm staying at Quality, Comfort, Clarion, and Sleep Hotels because I can get a roll of color film processed for just a dollar. But call now before this offer disappears. <laughs> Your family gets a great room and a great film deal. Call 800-221-2222. We have only a little over a minute left, so one quick observation, a quick question, and perhaps three quick answers. The only disincentive to foreign operations from taking an American hostage is to pretend or to act as though it really doesn't matter and it really isn't going to have an impact. Is the United States ever capable of carrying that out? Jody Powell? I don't think that's the issue. The question is whether they are able to make us do things, change our policy. So far, they have not been able to do it through three administrations. 
Pat, you agree? I think I disagree. I think they have a victory here. They have gotten Bush's attention, brought him back to Washington, got the attention of the media. The Marines say you don't lose a platoon for a single man. We have eight people who are POWs. We cannot permit their fate to dictate American policy in a war against terror in the Middle East. All right, Minister Netanyahu, you have the closing word. I can tell you what our policy is. Uh, we don't want to um, lose sight of the hostages or POWs. We don't want to surrender to terrorists. There is a third way. Say you don't surrender, and at the same time apply pressure on the Hezbollah and on the governments that support them. That's what we're trying to do. We have now an offer on the table. We hope it'll be taken up. And if it is, I think these people will come home, and we haven't sacrificed our principles. Minister Netanyahu, thank you. Pat Buchanan, Jody Powell, thank you both for joining us this evening. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. This has been ABC News Nightline. If you wish a printed transcript of this or any Nightline broadcast, please send $3 to Nightline Transcripts, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 1007, or call area code 212-227-READ. This has been a presentation of ABC News, where more Americans get their news than from any other source.